Hello students, welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Dr. Seema Kalra from Indira Gandhi National Open University. Today, we are going to talk on module Vaccinology 2, Types of Vaccines under the paper Molecular Therapeutics. You know that vaccines are the biological preparations that trigger immune response to produce antibodies and provide immunity against an infection without exposing an individual to the infection itself. So after completing this module, you should be able to understand different types of vaccines. What are the different antigens in these vaccines? What are the advantages and limitations of each type of vaccine? and the challenges which are being faced by scientific community during development of new vaccines. Let us first try to understand what are the different qualities we would expect in an ideal vaccine. Smallpox was the first vaccine which was developed by Edward Cheddar in 1796. However, it took almost a century before another vaccine was developed by Louis Pasteur who established the basic principles of vaccines that is to isolate, inactivate and inject the disease causing microorganisms. So based on these principles many modern day vaccines have been developed. So as the science progressed more and more information became available on the cycles of pathogens their mode of entry into the host, the mechanism of pathogenesis, antigenic components. So this information has been used to develop vaccines which are more effective and less side effects. So what would be a, uh, we expect from a vaccine, a good vaccine candidate? It should have a long lasting immunity. It should be able to produce both humoral and cell mediated immunity, it should be safe, it should not induce any autoimmunity or hypersensitivity, inflammatory responses should be minimized, then cost effectiveness is another aspect, so it should be easy to administer and store and it should have high effectiveness in large proportion of population, that is the concept of herd immunity. Let's now see what are the different vaccines which are available. Live attenuated vaccines, inactivated vaccines, subunit vaccines, conjugate vaccines and recombinant vaccines. So we shall discuss about these vaccines one by one. Live attenuated vaccines consist of live disease causing pathogens that is bacteria or viruses that have been weakened or attenuated under laboratory conditions. So the immune response which they generate is similar to the natural infection only difference is that these do not cause any disease. So basically the humoral as well as cell mediated immune responses are generated Viral vaccines which belong to this category are polio, measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, yellow fever and rotavirus. Whereas BCG for tuberculosis and oral typhoid vaccine come under bacterial live attenuated vaccines. So let's understand what is attenuation. So attenuation is basically when you try to modify the microorganism in such a way so that its immunogenicity or the tendency to cause infection is reduced and this is achieved by repeated culturing the microorganism under laboratory conditions. The measles virus which is used in this vaccine was isolated from a child back way in 1954 and it took almost 10 years of serial passage using tissue culture media to transform wild type into attenuated form. 
Similarly, strain of Mycobacterium bovis developed in France by Kamit and Gurin to make the BCG vaccine is being used since 1923. In fact, it is interesting that in due course of time when genome sequences of Mycobacterium tuberculosis became available in 1998, the comparison of Mycobacterium bovis showed that it has lost as many as nine sets of genes during attenuation. Another method of attenuation is altered tropism, that is growing the microbe in foreign host such as laboratory animals or different site of infection and all these methods actually lead to loss of genes responsible for infection reducing their antigenicity. So what are the advantages? The advantages of live attenuated vaccines include stimulation of memory cell mediated as well as humoral immune responses. So that is why you don't need to give multiple booster doses. So these vaccines are quite effective. Limitations of live attenuated vaccines are like you need to have proper storage because these vaccines are effective only when the microorganism is able to replicate and produce the immune response. So any harsh conditions might inactivate the microorganism making the vaccines ineffective. Because of very strong immune response they generate, live attenuated vaccines are unsafe for immunosuppressed persons like those having leukemia or HIV as well as for the pregnant women. Further, if there are circulating antibodies into in the blood, for example, uh, from the maternal sources or they have been injected, so they interfere with the live attenuated microorganism and as a result the efficacy of vaccine decreases and this process is referred to as vaccine failure. And then another problem with these vaccines is pathogenic reversion. So basically what it means is that attenuated pathogen may revert back to original form. Uh, this has been observed in case of oral polio vaccine which contains three live polio strains in attenuated form. So the type 1 strain has 57 mutations, it has never reverted to the wild type but the other two strains that is type 2 and type 3 each have only two relevant mutations. So they require only two reversions to become pathogenic again. Indeed it has occurred on number of occasions. So the next category is inactivated vaccines. The antigen in these vaccines is the whole bacteria or virus but it is killed or inactivated through physical or chemical processes like heat, gamma radiations or formaldehyde treatment. So that is why these killed microorganisms cannot replicate and they do not cause any disease even in immunosuppressed persons. And the immunity which they generate is only humoral immune response, no cell mediated responses generated, whole cell pertussis and inactivated poliovirus vaccines belong to this category. So uh, let's see what are the advantages of inactivated vaccines. Uh, first advantage is that they do not cause any disease therefore they are much safer than the live attenuated vaccines. They can be injected even in immunosuppressed persons uh, like those suffering from HIV or leukemia as well as pregnant women. Then they are much more stable than live attenuated vaccines. Inactivated vaccines are less affected by circulating antibodies. Circulating antibodies we mean is the one which are coming from the maternal or the one which have been uh, injected from outside. So sometimes these vaccines, uh, these type of antigens may interfere with the vaccine antigen but such a case is not seen in case of inactivated vaccine.
disadvantages include multiple periodic booster doses because the immune response which is generated is much weaker and they can induce only humoral response no little little or no cellular mediated immunity so generally their first dose will not produce the protective immunity so the multiple doses are required and in these cases sometimes even the antibody titer it also diminishes with time so let's compare the attenuated that is uh, live virus vaccines and then inactivated vaccines that is killed vaccines the method of production is selection of the virulent organisms is by growing under adverse culture conditions or prolonged passage of a virulent human pathogen through different hosts whereas in case of inactivated vaccine it is inactivated by chemical or irradiation by gamma radiation there is no requirement of booster dose in case of attenuated vaccines inactivated vaccines need multiple booster doses inactivated vaccines are relatively more stable as compared to attenuated vaccines therefore it can prove as an advantage for third world countries where refrigeration is limited immunity wise attenuated vaccines are better as they produce both humoral and cell mediated immunity whereas inactivated produces only humoral immunity then reversion tendency case of attenuated vaccines whereas in inactivated the reversion is not there now one thing which is critical in case of inactivated vaccines is adjuvants because the immune response is comparatively weaker so they are generally added into inactivated vaccines and most widely used are the aluminum salts subunit vaccines so as the name suggest there is some part of the pathogen which has antigenic properties like toxins subcellular fragment or cell surface antigen so all these are used as antigen in subunit vaccines so again this type of vaccine does not induce t cell immune response only antibodies are induced so b cell mediated immune response is there which is a weak immune response so you need antigens adjuvants to be added in these vaccines subunit vaccines are of three types polysaccharide toxoid and protein so these names have been given based on the part which has been used as antigen coming to polysaccharide subunit vaccines some bacteria while infected human cells they are protected by a polysaccharide capsule which helps the organism to evade the human defense system so these vaccines create immune response against these polysaccharide molecules in the bacterial capsule these include haemophilus influenza b vaccine pneumococcal disease meningococcal disease and then salmonella typhimurium is also a polysaccharide based subunit vaccine toxoids toxoids are the toxins that are inactivated by heat or chemicals some microorganisms like diphtheria tetanus pertussis they secrete toxins which are the reason of pathogenesis rather than the microorganism itself so these toxins are used as antigens in vaccines known as toxoids so basically when you inject toxoid the immunity is built again toxin and it may not be necessarily against the microorganism which has produced that toxin diphtheria tetanus pertussis and botulinum these are toxoid vaccines protein subunit vaccines so these include certain specific proteins which have been isolated from the pathogen and show antigenic properties for example in hepatitis b vaccine it is composed of hepatitis b virus surface antigen then a cellular pertussis contains inactivated 
pertussis toxin protein and some other bacterial components. Advantages of subunit vaccines is the less risk of diseases because there is no live pathogen in these vaccines so therefore the disease will not develop. They can be safely given to immunosuppressed people and these vaccines are much more stable and safer than the live vaccines. Disadvantages of course because of weaker immunogenicity they are not very effective in children younger than two years multiple doses are required and then antibody titer also does not go up with multiple doses. Isolated antigen may not retain its native conformation therefore antigens may not be able to recognize the same antigen on the pathogen surface. This is specifically true with protein vaccines. Conjugate vaccines. Now the disadvantages which are seen with pure polysaccharide vaccines they can be overcome by conjugating the pure polysaccharide to a carrier protein. So various type of carrier proteins are used these include diphtheria and tetanus toxins. So conjugation with the toxin results in change of immune response from T cell independent to T cell dependent leading to improved immune response in infants as well as the antibody booster response to multiple doses of vaccines. The first conjugated vaccine was developed against influenza virus. Later on conjugate vaccines were developed for pneumococcal disease in 2000 and meningococcal disease in 2005. Uh, let's see uh, what are the advantages of conjugate vaccines. Now these vaccines are effective against the diseases which are caused by encapsulated bacteria for which pure polysaccharide subunit vaccines have been ineffective. They are also effective in infants which are at most risk and provide short term protection in rest of the population. Recombinant vaccines are the second generation vaccines which have been produced using genetic engineering. They contain antigens which are prepared by inserting the gene of the desired antigen of the microbe into a vector. So vaccines for hepatitis B and human papilloma virus are produced by this method then live typhoid vaccine also contains genetically modified salmonella type B. Um, it has been modified so as not to cause any disease. Then live attenuated influenza vaccine is also a genetically engineered uh, microbe to replicate effectively in mucosa of nasopharynx but not in lungs. So this figure shows you how the vaccines for hepatitis B and human papilloma virus have been produced by inserting the viral segment into a vector which could be yeast or virus to produce hepatitis B surface antigen protein or human papilloma virus capsid protein. Recombinant vaccines provide us the choice of vectors which are not only safe but they are also easy to grow and store. Then uh, there is a choice of eliminating antigens which do not produce enough immunity or those which produce adverse effects. Disadvantage is cost effectivity because the cost of production is high as compared to other vaccines. So far from this discussion on different type of vaccines we can conclude that vaccines containing limited number of purified antigens such as subunit vaccines or recombinant vaccines generally have improved tolerance safety profile as compared to live attenuated or whole pathogen vaccines. But the disadvantage is that they are often less immunogenic due to removal of the pathogenic features of the organism. 
combination vaccines. Now, combination vaccines, as the name suggests, contain two or more antigens in the same preparations. The approach has been used for over 50 years in many vaccines such as MMR, that is measles, mumps and rubella, and DTWP, that is diphtheria, tetanus, pertussis. The only thing which need to be carefully monitored in these kind of vaccines is their efficacy has to be tested before introduction and secondly adjuvants because the adjuvants may affect the activity of different antigens in a different way or other components of the vaccines may interact with each other affecting the efficacy of these vaccines. Combination vaccines give us the advantage of reducing the cost of stocking and administering the separate vaccines. They also reduce the cost of extra healthcare visits because the multiple vaccines are injected at the same time. Uh, they facilitate the addition of new vaccines into the immunization program, simplify the vaccine administration and save the children from the pain of multiple injections. Monovalent and polyvalent vaccines. So these are the vaccines. Uh, monovalent are the vaccines which contain single strain of a single antigen like measles and belong to monovalent vaccine. Whereas multivalent vaccine contains multiple antigens, strains or microorganisms. These include oral polio vaccine. Let's understand what are monovalent and polyvalent vaccines. Monovalent vaccine contains single strain of the microorganism and measles vaccine belong to this category. Multivalent vaccines contain multiple antigens or strains or microorganisms. Example is oral polio vaccine. Let's see how these vaccines are introduced into our body. Now different modes of administrations are available, oral, intramuscular, subcutaneous, intradermal. Intramuscular vaccines are generally adjuvant containing and they have potentially irritating antigens. These are used for potentially irritating antigens like tetanus. Intramuscular vaccination is used for the antigens which are irritating, for example, tetanus, diphtheria vaccine, and generally these also contain adjuvants. Subcutaneous mode of administration is used for live viral vaccine to lessen the discomfort due to local inflammation, for example, yellow fever vaccine. Intradermal injection BCG vaccine to reduce the amount of antigen needed, oral route is basically stimulates the intestinal IgA and other mucosal immune mechanisms which defend against pathogenesis of infection. So these include oral polio vaccine, oral typhoid vaccine, oral vaccines for administration by nasal, rectal and vaginal routes are under investigation. Now let's see what are the different challenges we face in vaccinology? There are basically two major types of challenges. One is population related challenges and then we have pathogen related challenges which are creating problems in the field of vaccines. Pathogens that make vaccine development challenging are HIV, hepatitis B virus because they can change the antigen during the course of infection itself because of high rate of mutations they can evade the human immune system. Then we have influenza virus where interspecies variations and coexistence of multiple strains are seen. There are microbes with complex life cycles like malaria those which induce immune dysfunction in the host like HIV and those which have the latent disease phase like herpes viruses and mycobacterium tuberculosis, human papilloma virus. 
So these pose a challenge for development of universally effective vaccines. Malaria, for example, will not induce immunity after natural infection. BCG is effective in preventing severe rapidly progressive tuberculosis in children but does not prevent infection or reactivation of the latent disease and therefore it has shown little impact on tuberculosis disease control over the world. Similarly, the pertussis vaccines, they have successfully reduced childhood deaths from pertussis but their short duration of protection means the vaccinated individuals may get affected when they grow up. Let's see uh, some of the population related challenges, elderly immune senescence. Now prevention of infectious diseases in elderly has become a priority in 21st century as the proportion of older individual is increasing globally. So with increasing age, their immune system is weakened and immune responses are decreased. So even if they are given traditional uh, vaccines, the immune response is not that strong. Moreover, infants, in, they have the immune system which is still not mature. And another problem which is faced is by immunosuppressed patients and the pregnant women because there we need to balance the advantages of vaccines with the risks associated with these population. So multiple approaches are being used to address the challenges of these population and pathogens. Different approaches are used and these developments have been enabled by expanding knowledge within the field of immunology, improved understanding in how the immune system responds to pathogens and individual antigens at the molecular level and improved understanding of effect of immune deficiencies and of aging on response to immunization. Further, bioinformatic tools have also helped in exploring the genomes of pathogens for protein coding sequences, which can be a potential target for vaccine preparation. So some of these approaches include reverse vaccinology. So reverse vaccinology is actually opposite of the conventional approach, which is from pathogenesis to vaccine. Whereas this case, the vaccine development leads to understanding of pathogen. The approach has been successfully used for development of licensed vaccines against meningococcal type B. Structural vaccinology is further evolution of reverse vaccinology. It integrates genome based approach with structured biology with an idea that protective determinants can be used to selectively engineer the antigens that can be redesigned and simplified for inclusion in the vaccine combinations. Structural vaccinology is used to develop vaccines against various microbes. Microbes evolve variants of protective surface antigens to infect host with existing immunity. So the key protective antigen genes are identified in the genome sequence of pathogen isolates on the basis of their variant sequence. The reverse vaccinology provides for testing of isolated recombinant products in the animal models. Then structural vaccinology analyzes the 3D structure and vaccine testing of individual domains. Variant domains that elicit protective immunity are assembled into a single hybrid antigen to elicit protection against the infection. System vaccinology. It relies on next generation sequencing and post genomic technologies to acquire the high throughput data and analyze it, which can be used to define and monitor overall human response and changes which occur following vaccination. So uh, this brings us to the end of this presentation. So let's summarize what we have learned so far in this module. 
Various type of vaccines have been developed and applied in humans, which can be classified into two main groups. One, live attenuated pathogens, which mimic the natural infections, but are weakened or attenuated so as not to cause any infection. These have been successfully used against diseases like smallpox, measles, polio, yellow fever. The second group comprises of the vaccines like inactivated vaccines, inactivated proteins, toxins, diphtheria and tetanus, subunit like hepatitis B, polysaccharide based like pneumococcus and conjugate vaccines such as meningococcus haemophilus influenza type B. Live attenuated vaccines, they confer lifelong memory. So second vaccination group usually require adjacent adjuvants to enhance the induced immune response as well as boosting strategies that maintain the protective immunity. So in spite of many success stories of vaccines, many challenges still lie ahead in the development of new vaccines. Bioinformatics have come to rescue and newer approaches like reverse vaccinology, system biology, structural vaccinology are being explored for antigen discovery and design as well as investigation of the vaccine responses. Thank you.